So let's see what happens when the current lock holder comes around to unlocking uh, the lock. Uh, what she's going to do is, is going to execute the unlock algorithm. And the unlock algorithm, the first thing that it does is it sets this position that the uh, lock holder had from HL to MW. And the reason for that is, is that this is a circular queue. And since the circular queue, even though queue last is here, future requesters can, can come around and then eventually uh, somebody may come here and may want to occupy this particular slot and they have to know that they have to wait. And that's the reason the first thing that the current lock holder does is to mark this spot that he used to be at as HL. The next thing that the current lock holder is, is going to do is signal the next guy in the circular queue. So the current lock holder was here, so he's marked it as MW for future requesters that may come and wait on his part. And the next request in the circular queue is the guy next to him. And therefore, what he is doing is he is saying, you know, current plus one mod n is going to be set to HL. And so that guy would have been waiting. Um, in this position, and so he'll get the signal, and therefore um, he'll be ready to go, and he can get into the critical section and do whatever he wants to do with the data structure that is protected by this particular lock. Now this will go on, and eventually my predecessor will become the current lock holder. And when my predecessor is done using the lock, he'll come around to do an unlock, and when the current lock holder, who is my predecessor, does the unlock operation, that's going to be resulting in a signal for me. Because basically, he's going to set the flags array, the next part in the flags array, as HL. And that's the spot I'm waiting on. Uh, so good news for me. Uh, I've got my position marked as HL. And what that means is that now I've got the lock. And now I can go off into the critical section, do what I need to do in order to uh, do the code that is associated with the critical section protected by this particular lock L. Now that we understand how the lock and the un unlock algorithm works with this array-based queuing, let's talk about some of the virtues of this algorithm. The first thing that you notice is that there's exactly one atomic operation that you have to carry out per, per critical section. So every time you want to acquire a lock, you come in and do a fetch and increment, and that is all that you do in order to get the lock. And so there's one atomic operation that you do per critical section. That's good news. And the other thing that you also notice is that the processes are all sequenced. Uh, or in other words, there is fairness. Uh, so whoever comes first gets into the queue ahead of me. And when I come in, if s people are going to come after me, they're going to get queued up after me. So that's good news also. And the spin variable. Uh, because I mark my position in this uh, array, my spin variable is distinct from the spin variables of all the other guys that may be waiting for the same lock. That's another good thing. In other words, I'm completely unaffected by all the signaling that would have happened when the uh, guys that were ahead of me were getting the lock and, and signaling the next guys and so on. I'm completely impervious to that because I'm spinning on my own private variable waiting for the lock. And of course, a uh, corollary to what I just said is that uh, whenever uh, a lock is released, exactly one guy is signaled to indicate that they've got the lock. And, and that's another important virtue of uh, this particular algorithm. So it is fair, and it is also not noisy. So these are two things that are um, very good things about uh, this algorithm. And this we saw where you know, the deficiency of the ticket lock algorithm was exactly that, uh, that it is fair, but it is noisy when the lock is released. So that problem has gotten away with this queuing lock. Now, you might be wondering, are there any downside to this uh, array-based uh, queuing lock? Um, uh, sure there is. The first thing um, I'm sure that you've noticed already is the size of the data structure is as big as the number of processors in the multiprocessor. So the space complexity <coughs> for this algorithm is order of n for every lock that you have in the multi-program. So if you have a large-scale multiprocessor with thousands of processors, that can start eating into the memory space. Um, so that's something that you have to watch out for. So the space can be a big overhead. And the reason why I'm emphasizing that is because in any well-structured uh, multi-threaded program, um, even though you may have uh, lots of threads executing in, in all the processors, at any point of time for a particular lock, there may not be contention by all the processes. Only a subset of them may be requesting the lock. But still, 
this particular algorithm has to worry about the worst case uh, contention for a lock, and therefore it creates a data structure that is as big as the number of processors that you have in the multiprocessors. And that's the only downside to this, but all the other things are good stuff about this algorithm. And of course, the reason why you have that downside with, the, with this particular uh, Anderson's queuing lock is the fact that the queue is being simulated by a static data structure, an array. And since it is a static data structure and you have to worry about the worst case contention among uh, requesters for a lock, uh, we have to make the static array as big as the number of processors. So that's really the, uh, the catch in this particular algorithm. Next, we will look at another algorithm, a lock algorithm that's also based on queuing, but it doesn't have the space complexity of Anderson's uh, queuing lock.